Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of WNCL-TV Profiles. This is Dave Van De Pass here with our special guest for the week, our guest star, Roger Williams. Roger. <laughs> nice to have you back with us, my friend. Hey, it's good to be here. Good. How long have... How, how come you're not out in the sun today? It's me? It's beautiful out there. I never get a chance to get out in the sun. This is the hardest working no. man on the whole ship, I swear. <laughs> and he never stops. How long have you been on board now? We're, it, we're, we're interviewing David today. Yeah, right. let me see now. <laughs> well, I started out when I was four, and I've been... <laughs> How many times have you been here now? You're, you're here more often than I am, I think. Well, this is about the fourth time. Oh, it's got to be more than that. Maybe it is. I haven't counted. I'm having so much fun that uh, I don't even count anymore. You were here four times last year alone, I think. I think so. Yeah. And I'll be here four times this year. Too. Terrific. Terrific. You guys are gluttons for punishment. Are you kidding? <laughs> you must be joking. You're one of the most popular guys. I can say that without hesitation, that we have on board, one of the most popular performers. You, you, you just, uh, I'm just so happy, not only because I like to see you, but I'm mean, happy to see you on the, uh, on the list of the entertainers that are coming, because I know it's just going to be the passengers are going to be so satisfied. Now you got me on the spot. I've got to be good to yeah. you. <laughs> what have you been doing, Roger, since we saw you last? I've been moving around. In fact, uh, a week ago today, let's see, I was in a concert in Salt Lake City. Uh, did a big concert there, a two and a half hour concert. Afterwards, I went over to the Tabernacle and played for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Oh, man. I got to say that very carefully because Woody Allen says the Mormon Snabernacle Choir. <laughs> and, uh, they're wonderful people, great talents. Yeah. I hope to make an album with them next year. Oh, great. Yeah. I would love to hear that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Speaking of albums, I know that you have a new album out. And there's kind of a very interesting story behind this. Uh, you and I were discussing it uh, just a little while ago. You want to tell us about that? Well, you guys know that I've made close to 100 albums now. And in this business, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, things can, one day you're down, the next day you're up. Yeah. One of my down days, I got a call from Paul McCartney of the Beatles. I didn't know that Paul even dug what I did. I'd, I'd heard that he liked my music, but uh, all of a sudden he called and asked if I wouldn't do a Tupac album for him. He said, we're going to do it over in London. And actually, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have time to go to London. Yeah. I, I'm booked so solidly. And he said, well, we'll bring out the Royal Philharmonic, which has 65 musicians. And we'll record the album over here in London. You send us the tapes of what you'd like to do. We'll yeah. record it, and then we'll send it back to you. You dub it on, and we'll have an album. And I'd oh. never done that before, David. My gosh. I, and it was really something to do. I uh, should say. And a great, it turned out to be our best album, actually. So you sent him over, the, you played some stuff, some yeah, things. Yeah, I just got some ideas and put them down on tape. Then they had an arranger over in London put them down for orchestra. Mm -hmm. Then they sent the stuff back and I recorded on top of that. And it really sounds as though we were all there together. It turned out great. <laughs> and it, has it been doing well? It's been doing sensational. Good. Everywhere is reordering. In fact, it's probably the fastest taken off album I've had for years and years. Good for you. And you know, it's a funny thing. Um, you know, kids rebel against their parents. And so for a long time, why the music that I played was kind of, you know, well, the kids call it elevator music. Uh, but now those kids, Paul McCartney's age, have children of their own. Mm -hmm. And these kids are growing up. And they're rebelling against their parents who loved rock and roll. So they're coming back to guys like me and discovering us, uh -huh. and it's really thrilling. Uh, they're playing a lot of uh, Ella Fitzgerald. They're yes. playing all the big bands. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids are really digging what we do. You can't keep quality down. Well, I guess the uh, name of the game is survival. Yeah. I've known a lot of movie stars, very famous ones, and they all say the same thing. They say, by golly, I survived. And if you do something well, why eventually, if you breathe long enough, mm -hmm. they'll come around your way. Yeah. Of all the albums you've done, and you've, you say you've done around 100, do you have, I, this is a hard question, do you have favorites? What, 
uh, I know you said something to me just before uh, we went on, that this may be the best album you've ever done. Well, I'm prejudiced. I always like the last one I did. Yeah, I gotta sure, tell you sure. the truth. I understand it's that. It's the same way with concerts. I always look forward to the next one. It's going to be the best concert I ever played in my life. And tonight, I'm playing a concert here. And I really want it to be the best one I've ever played. I think the reason I say that, I feel that especially here on the ship. A lot of people here have saved a long time in their lives to, mm -hmm. to make this trip. They plan for weeks and months about doing this thing. And I want to be sure they get the best that I've got. So I, I'm looking forward to this one. You know, there's a, there's a quality in you that uh, people can feel. It uh, goes beyond professionalism. This is, a, this is a lifetime commitment that comes from the soul for you. Uh, just the feeling of what you say, your performances, uh, and that comes across so well on the stage that it is going to be absolutely the best thing that you've ever done, this commitment. How, how many hours do you practice a day? Well, I practice every minute I can. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And let's say something else. I am a great pianist, but everything else, there are very few things that I do well. I really play the piano. This yeah. is what I was born to do, and I think that all of us, our quest in life is really to find out what we do best, because every one of us do something better than anybody else in the world. I believe that. Of course, the trick is to find out what it is sometime. <laughs> Yeah, I get a little upset with parents sometimes because they, they get all shook up about their kids. They say, I sent the bum to school for three years or four years, and he came out and he doesn't even want to do it. Well, lots of times it's more important to find out in life what we can't do mm -hmm. than what we can do. Sure. And there's so many things in the world to choose from, and sometimes kids think, well, boy, that's, that looks great. You know, I'm going to do that. And then they get into it, and they find out that they really don't like it. So they change, and we get a little impatient with them because we've invested a lot of money in them, and we say, hey, you know, you chose that, why don't you do it? But as I said before, lots of times it's important to know what you can't do. The main thing is to, with me at least, is to maintain discipline and drive. Those two things, discipline and drive. If I can do those things, why, everything else seems to fall into line for yeah. me. Yeah. What how, how long is, or when did you find out that you were a pianist? How, how many, uh, I mean, did, did you practice? Did your mom send you to, for lessons? Uh, how did that happen? Well, I was lucky, David. Um, I walked up to the piano when I was three and played Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Um, I had to stand up. I, <laughs> I was too small to sit down. <laughs> um, Three years was, old, huh? Three years old, yeah. I was born into a religious family. My mm -hmm. dad was a boxer, and he turned preacher after he saw a friend of his killed in the ring. Mm. And uh, so in my lifetime, uh, I was brought up in the church. But like all the kids, I hated to practice. And uh, I just couldn't get disciplined enough to really get in there and do the work I should. And everything came so easy for me. I played, gee, I played... 13 instruments by the time I was 12 years old. Good gosh. Well, it doesn't sound like such a big deal because people in the church, their kids would take instruments and the kids would get sick of them so the people would donate them to the church. Yeah. And whatever came in, I'd play. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I never wanted to practice and it came so easy for me that when I got into school, I have a bachelor's degree in engineering, mm -hmm. believe it or not. But then I went back and took my master's and have a doctorate in music. So it took me a little time to find out, too. Lots of times, the thing that we do best comes so doggone easy to us that we say, hey, that isn't worth anything. It's too easy to do. I'd rather be like that guy over there. Look what he does. And I can't do it, so it must be hard, and I better work on that. But many times, the things that we do best, they just are very easy for us, and so we discount them. But the other guy can't do what we do. Yeah, yeah. Um, after you, or while you were in school, is that when you started to play professionally? How did, how did it happen for you in show business-wise? I mean, did somebody just hear you playing and then suddenly said, this guy is terrific, we're going to make an album, or uh, I want him to appear on a show of mine or something? Boy, that sounds great, David. I wish I were through. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I went to Juilliard and took some postgraduate work. And while I was there, well, one of the girl singers told me, she said, I'm trying out for Arthur Godfrey. 
She said, would you accompany me? I said, sure. So I went up to the audition, and in those days, why well, they had literally hundreds of people auditioning for this show. It was a big deal. Do you remember the Arthur Godfrey Town Scout sure. show? That's a long time ago. Anyway, I went up, and she got cold feet, and she didn't show up. Oh, jeez. And so I was sitting there, and they called her name, and I thought, by damn, I'm going to give it a shot. And I stood up, and I said, uh, hey, look, I'm not the singer, but would you listen to me? He said, look, we got all these people here. I said, just listen to me, and when you're tired, just tell me to leave. He said, okay, come in and do your thing. So I played the piano. I got on the show. I won. Oh. I was on for a week. Shortly after that, I did another show called Chance of a Lifetime with Dennis James, and I won a thousand bucks on that one. So things started to roll, and I was heard by a, na by a man by the name of David Capp, K-A-P-P. -P. He had been with Columbia, RCA, Victor, Decca, and he wanted to start his own uh, record company. Mm -hmm. And he'd also discovered Frankie Carl, Eddie Duchin, and Carmen Cavallaro, which were great pianists back in the 40s. Anybody remember them? Yeah, they were terrific. Well, anyway, I was playing a lot of jazz at this time, and I was taking jazz at Juilliard. And he heard me play, and he said, hey, he said, I've never heard anybody play the melody like you play it. He said, you play the words of a song. He said, when it says, I love you, he said, you play like that. When, you, when it says, I hate you, he said, your tone gets real brittle. He said, uh, come on in and record for me. But he said, don't play jazz. He said, just play the melody. And I said, well, that's going to be kind of hard because I like to improvise. He said, just play the melody. So we got in the studio, and the first thing I know, this guy wheels in a great big Indian, a cigar store Indian. And that Indian must have been six foot tall, and the Indian had his hand up on his head like this, and like he was looking out into space. And he put a big sign above the Indian's head saying, where's the melody? <laughs> so this was in front of the piano. And I start to play, and I start to improvise, and he's in the control room, and he keeps pointing to the Indian, where's the melody? <laughs> And Dave, I, I thought that was the corniest thing I'd ever done in my life. <laughs> but you know, the record started to sell. Yeah. And the first record, the first single I ever made was Autumn Leaves. And I think the most... <laughs> yeah. How can you beat that? Jeez. I haven't. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, that was a crazy thing. Yeah, how did that happen? Well, that was crazy, too, because the first actual piano solo I made for him was an album just of piano numbers. Mm -hmm. And he called me up on a Friday night, and he said, Roger, he said, I'm recording Jane Morgan Monday morning, and she only has three songs ready for her session. He said, you know the tune Autumn Leaves? I said, you mean Falling Leaves? <laughs> I didn't even know the title of the thing. He said, no, Autumn Leaves. He said... Bing Crosby brought this over a few years ago, and he said, Bing made an arrangement, Frank made an arrangement. He said, nobody's been able to make a hit of it. And he said, I think it's a great tune. So over the weekend, I made the arrangement. And I came in on Monday, and they had a floor just like this, was a, just a plain old floor of marble. And I sat in the corner because all the chairs were taken. He had a big orchestra. And I sat there until the last 11 minutes of the show, or the show, the recording session. And he said, we don't even have time to rehearse this doggone thing. He said, come on over to the piano and just play it and we'll record it. So I got up and sat down at the piano and played it. And it turned out that the record lasted, let's see, three minutes and two seconds. And in those days, why disc jockeys wouldn't play a record if it was over three minutes. He said, can you play those thirds a little faster? So I played it one more time, and the clock ran out. And I went home, and boy, my, my fondest dream for that record was that it would pay the next month's rent, because I was behind the month behind. And it's been paying it ever since, Dave. <laughs> Great story. A true story. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Have you got to cut uh, a special uh, fondness for one of the uh, songs on your new album? 
No, I like them all. Yeah. I'm, I'm prejudiced. <laughs> You're prejudiced, you like them all. No, it just turned out well. And Paul yeah. was very, you know, this guy's a perfectionist. Um, we did the album, and he did all the artwork on it. And he oh, held yeah. it up for, Jeez. yeah, he held it up for two weeks just because he was unhappy with the way part of the artwork turned out. He didn't like the hands on the front, and he changed it all around. And finally, he approved it and put it out. So um, It's a double album by the way. Yeah. And uh, these are going to be available after the show. Yeah, if anybody wants them, they're there. There'll uh, be somebody out in the hallway uh, after the shows tonight and tomorrow night. Well, let me run into some, some of See, the selections. See, I'm a good pianist, but I'm a lousy salesman. I hate to push my stuff. I don't know why. It's always been hard for me. Lots, yeah. of, uh, lots of great songs. Here. What I Did for Love, One, Just the Way You Are. It's a big, wide, wonderful world. Oh, beautiful. Great yeah, stuff. A lot of good tunes. Let's open the floor up for some questions in case anybody has anything that they'd like to ask Roger. If you do have a question for uh, Roger, please raise your hand. I see a lady with a question right over here, and Sean is on his way over with the microphone. Go ahead, ma'am. I'd like to know if the uh, natural ability that you were born with was any problem as far as learning to read the music, or was it a compliment instead of a problem? It was a problem and a, you know, most things are good and bad. They really are. As we get a little older, we realize that there's very little all white and all black. There's things in between. It was an advantage because any time my teacher would play a thing for me, I could play it back to her. So she got real smart. She wouldn't play them for me. And she'd put the music up in front of me, and then I'd have to read it, which was always very difficult for me. But I did learn to read that way. Uh -huh. So it was a blessing and a curse, both. <laughs> Another question. Here. Uh, we'd like to be personal and know if you have a family in Los Angeles. Yeah, I got three kids, and two of them are very fine musicians. Uh, the boy, Jim, is now part of the L.A. Jazz Choir. And they've been opening for Al Jarreau out on the road, who's a very fine singer. You ought to get him on here sometime. He's terrific. I'd like to try. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to. Any other questions for Roger? While you're thinking, oh, there's one gentleman there's one. over here. While you're thinking, I've got, uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, having come up through the business like you did, although you had the natural talent right from the beginning, have you got any words of wisdom for uh, the people out there who uh, who may have a niece or a nephew or a grandson or a child that, that has some talent, that really has aspirations in the business. What, what can you tell a young person today coming up, either in show business or in the music business? A little bit of advice. Well, that again is a hard question, but I'll answer it the best way I know how. Uh, when I was 11 years old, why well, my parents took me to see Paderewski. And at the end of the concert while well, everybody stood up and cheered and you know I'd been very much into baseball and football up until then and all of a sudden I saw this guy up on the stage and I saw all these people cheering him and I said hey maybe that could be me someday maybe you know maybe if I played a little less baseball and practice a little bit I could be that way and I think the problem is is that all the kids go see all the sports things but a lot of the parents don't take them to hear the great musicians. And if a kid does have talent, when he sees that, he's going to say, hey, now that's my hero. Because we all make heroes in life. We all look up to somebody and say, I want to be that way someday. Well, if they don't see these great artists, they're going to look up to the baseball heroes or the football heroes, even if they're musical. So if I would give you one piece of advice, it's take your kids to see the great artists and see how they react. Maybe they don't like them. That's fine. Then you've learned that they really don't want to be musicians. Great answer. Good answer. All right, Sean, go ahead. Question. Okay. Well, uh, since all good pianists uh, you generally start out when they're at a tender young age, uh, is there any hope for anyone that's in their late 50s to start out uh, playing a piano? <laughs> <laughs> since uh, I've been taking lessons for about two years, and it's pretty tough. <laughs> Only, I, for I my think, own only for my own benefit, I mean, not to be a professional. No, listen, I admire you. Uh, I want to start studying German and Swedish. That's my background. And I don't know either one of those languages, and I'm going to learn them. 
I think that if you want to do something in life, you can do it. And especially in this day and age, uh, with all the instruments available and all the music available, do you realize that you can get like 75 recordings of the Tchaikovsky first piano concerto? Now, when we were young, maybe there was one or two. Maybe Rubenstein made one. Maybe you got one by Horowitz. Now you just can listen to all kinds of music. And it's, honestly, it's never too late to start. That sounds corny, but I really believe it. And if you've wanted to do it all your life, by golly, do it. Okay, another question. Here we go. It's not really a question. It's a thank you for your contribution. I chased you down Tuesday night and got your autograph, and my husband kept saying, now don't you dare tell him you were raised on him. <laughs> but, but I'm 31, and you have always been around my, my home, and now my six-year-old will be there tonight. So thank you. Oh, is that ever enough? Wow, you made my day. <laughs> Terrific. You know, that's the greatest thrill. I, I really work very hard on my music, and I practice very hard. But the greatest thrill of all is, is just to have somebody say, hey, I really like what you're doing. Because I've always had a, I've, I'm talking a lot today, but I've always had a theory that there isn't enough money in the world to make a loser happy. We all want to be winners. And when people talk to me and say, hey, look at all the loot you're making, that's nice. I love the money. But I got to tell you, when a gal comes up and says, hey, I really like your music and I've been brought up with it, that does more for my ego and it does more for my self-image and self-esteem than any money you could ever give me. And that's why a lot of people in life, you say, hey, why doesn't that bum retire? You know, he's made it because he's got to live with himself every day. And the only thing we really have to live with is our self-image. And when I'm a winner, bread and water taste like lobster. And when I'm a loser, lobster tastes like you know what. <laughs> I remember one time... Boy, I'm talking a lot today, dude. Right. Um, I did a show with Al Hurt when I was first starting in this business. You know the trumpet player? Super. Yeah. And the reason I brought this up, I was watching Chariots of Fire the other night. Have you seen that movie? Remember when the Jewish guy had lost and he sat in the bleachers in, in the stadium and his girl came and she tried to cheer him up and he just sat there and he couldn't, you couldn't say anything to the guy. Well, the night I played with Al Hurt, he blew me right out of the stadium. <laughs> and I remember going outside of my dressing room and sitting in the bleachers. I must have sat there for three hours. And the next week, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat right. I was a loser. I had really been hurt where it hurts the most. And there wasn't anything in the world you could have done for me at that point. In fact, even tell me that I had the presidential nomination, not that that's a big deal anymore, <laughs> to make me happy because I was a loser. But to be a winner, I think, is the real secret of life. And being a winner is just doing what you do best and having somebody say to you, hey, you were great. That's for sure. Got time for one more question, Sean. But I have three. Would there be any Beatles records on this album, or Beatles songs on this recording? Yeah, sure. Would we be able to get autographed copies? And do you get to go on the whole cruise and relax some between <laughs> shows? Okay. The are you here for the whole duration? The first question is, the are there any Beatles tunes? Yeah, there are four of them that Paul wrote. Great tunes. Second question, will I autograph the albums? I'll sign anything but a check. <laughs> I mean it. Just stop me. I'm around, and I'll be here for the rest of the cruise. Great, great, so great. Uh, right. believe me. And whoever you, if you happen to buy an album, or just bring up a paper, I'll sign it, whatever. Just say to my manager, when can I see Rods? And we'll set it up, okay? Fine. 
Roger, I've got one question, one last question here for you. This is, I ask, I, I'm sure I've asked you this before, but maybe you get a different answer. This, not that the, uh, I'm, let me explain the question first. I'm looking for an anecdote, something that might have happened uh, to you on stage or off stage, uh, something funny that maybe even uh, wasn't funny at the time, that was uh, kind of, uh, ho you opened your eyes a little bit, but now, now when you look back on it, you say, holy mackerel, what a stitch that was. You got any, any instances that have happened? Well, there was one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's been a lot of them, actually. <laughs> it's some kind of a miracle when a show gets together, because invariably the piano's out of tune, yeah. or it's a lousy piano, and I'll go in and tell the guy, and he'll say, well, we just had it painted last week. <laughs> um, we got to Port Arthur, Texas. And I was playing a big benefit concert for the Kiwanis Club. And it was their first concert of the season. It was in uh, late September. And so they wheeled the piano up on stage and it had been down in the basement all summer. Now, Port Arthur, I don't know if anybody's from that area, but it's a very humid place. A lot of, lot of humidity there. So they wheeled the piano up on stage, and I pushed down a key, and it stayed down. <laughs> and I pushed down the next one, and it stayed down. <laughs> now, this was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I had an 8 o'clock show that night. Oh, jeez. So I panicked. I didn't know what to do, and there wasn't another big piano in town. And one of the Kiwanis guys said, hey, he said, uh, what's really the trouble with that piano? Well, I said, all the felts are wet. That's the hammers that come up and hit the strings. He said, well, why don't, we, why don't I call my wife and she'll get the girls together and they'll get their hair dryers and come down here and dry those felts out. <laughs> so we took the lid off the piano and here were all these gals standing around. They plugged them all in, all the way around the piano with their hair dryers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can just see it. And by the time we did the show, why, everything was great. All the things worked great. That's one of those times when you, you know. Yes. The <laughs> yes. All right, wait, wait one moment until we get the microphone over there. We've got one more question. If you, if, you, if you ask it, okay, okay. Hang on just a second now. All right. This is a statement to Roger Williams. He played in Lafayette, Louisiana only a few months ago, and he is known there as the kindest, most compassionate man that there is. He played in a concert, and there was one person in our city that wanted so badly to hear him. She was in an automobile accident, was in the hospital, and after his concert, he went to visit her in oh. the hospital. So Roger Williams' name goes around Lafayette, Louisiana, as the most wonderful, compassionate person that there is. Is that a real great? Super guy. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss him. If you miss this gentleman in his concerts tonight and tomorrow night, you have really missed something. The incomparable Roger Williams. Roger, thank you for being here.